So it's perhaps um, useful to look at that using an example um, to bring it to life a bit. I'm going to, the examples I'm afraid are all clinical trials, but hopefully you can imagine patients being replaced by animals or samples or something, and the same approaches will apply regardless of what your unit of measurement is where you're taking the repeated measurements. So this was a clinical trial of three treatments for hypertension. So there were patients suffering from high blood pressure and these three alternative treatments were used to try and see which uh, had most effect on lowering blood pressure. So what was done is they measured for two pre-treatment periods and then they gave them one of three treatments and there were four post-treatment periods and they were separated by two weeks each period. And these are the number of patients that attended at each of the, the total of six visits. And you can see that after treatment, quite a few patients are dropping out. So the data are not complete. So we do need a mixed model if we want to analyze all the data together. So the fixed effects going into the model you remember in uh, mixed models there's fixed effects and there's random effects. So the random effects are the ones we allow random variability between the fixed effects are the ones we're interested in estimating and testing. So here we would consider the treatment effect. We're interested in knowing if that differs between the um, if that differs at all. And the time effect will include that in the model. And we'll test the treat treatment by time interaction and also by including the interaction we can get the treatment effect at each time point if we want to. Because we had these pre-treatment measurements by fitting, we'll take the second pre-treatment measurement and fit that as a baseline covariate in the model and that's going to reduce the amount of variability in the data by taking into account the variability between the patients before they even got the treatment. Just thinking a bit about this time by treatment interaction, um, it is an optional effect. You don't have to fit it in the model. It's usually useful to see if there is an interaction, but it's interesting to see what the differences are depending on whether you put it in. If you include it in the model, obviously you can get the treatment differences at each time point, test the treatments at every time point. But the other thing to note is that your overall treatment effects are going to be an unweighted average across each time point. So even if you've only got a few patients at some of the time points, there's been a lot of dropping out, the overall treatment effects are going to be an unweighted average regardless because you've got that interaction in. If you don't have the interaction in, and that's sometimes not a bad thing to do if it's not significant you're, or you're not interested in the treatment effect at individual time points, you might take it out. And then the treatment effects are going to be a weighted average of the treatment effects at individual time points. And the weights, well, they're going to relate to the variances at each time point and to some extent to the number of observations at each time point, but it's not strictly going to be weighting the, uh, having a weight factor relating to the variance and a number of observations. There are other things that are going to come into the estimate as well, but um, it's not like one, this weighted one or the unweighted, there's not one particular one that's right or wrong. You might think it's more appropriate to get an unweighted average, regardless of the fact that there's a lot of data missing at some time points. So it's useful to see how fitting an interaction is going to affect your overall treatment effect. So first of all, before looking at the results for the fixed effects, we'll consider a range of different covariance patterns. So um, look at uh, these ones which probably more useful if we look at the results because you probably can't remember what each of these structures are. So this table first of all shows the covariance matrix that was obtained for each of the structures and the next column we've got well this is from SAS it gives us actually minus twice the log likelihood and we can use that to do the, log, the likelihood ratio tests to see which of the more complex models are a significant improvement. And in brackets here, I've got the number of covariance parameters fitted in each of the models. So the first two models are quite simple ones. We've got compound symmetry, where we've got a constant correlation across the four time points, 0.53. In the second model, um, this is an autoregressive structure, so it allows that correlation to decay 
and it's estimated that the best correlation is 0.57 for observations separated by one visit um, and then it decays exponentially so the effect of this is it's going to be actually quite small for observations correlation between observations at visits one and four because it's going to be 0.57 cubed whereas that in its it's restricted to be that, so that might be a bit smaller than is appropriate. Now, both those models just use two covariance parameters, so the likelihood ratio test doesn't need to be done. We can just compare the likelihoods directly, and the one with the highest likelihood is going to be model one. Remember, this is minus twice the log likelihood, so we actually want the lowest value of that. So um, out of those two, we'd choose model one. We could then go on and make the model a bit more complicated, and consider this turplet structure where there's a band of correlations depending on the separation of the visits. And you can see, although it decreases a bit for observations separated by two visits when they're separated by three visits, it hasn't really decreased at all, which was probably why this autoregressive structure didn't come up as anything better than the compound symmetry. We can now do a likelihood ratio test to compare this to model one and take the difference between minus twice the log likelihood here and for model one. And because there's two extra parameters in this model that has a chi-squared, that can be tested against a chi-squared distribution with two degrees of freedom. And it gives a value of, the test statistic is 12.7, which is actually significant. So we can conclude that this um, turplet structure is an improvement on the compound symmetry structure. So it's better to allow these correlations to decrease a bit if they're not just one visit apart. A more a structure involving more parameters, this general structure. So we've got a separate correlation for each pair of time points and a separate variance. These are the variances down here for each time point. And in a similar way, the model can be compared. We'll compare it to the Model 3, which we showed was better than Model 1, using a chi-squared test, and that didn't quite come out to be significant because we've got six extra parameters and um, our chi-squared statistic of 8.25 wasn't significant, so that wasn't an improvement. So we, we've got no need for these extra six parameters in the model. And another thing I mentioned was sometimes the uh, covariances or the variances might differ between the treatment groups, so we can look at that by fitting, first of all, quite a simple model. We'll use the compound symmetry structure again and have it separate for each of the three treatment groups. Now, because this model isn't nested within the turplet structure, we can't compare them directly, but we can compare to model one using a likelihood ratio test. We've got four extra parameters in this model because there's six in total compared to model one. And that gives us a significant chi-squared statistic, so that's a significant improvement. But we'd also found that that turplet structure was quite useful. That was a significant improvement too. So we might then go on to look at the turplet structure separately for each of the treatment groups. And that's now got 12 parameters. And if we compare to either Model 3 or Model 5, that's a significant improvement. So it has been possible to justify quite a complicated covariance structure. It's different for each treatment group and it's overall it's turplets so it's taking account of the separation of the visits in saying how correlated the repeated measures are. In the last column just for information although I don't use it I've put Ikeke's cri information criterion and in fact this is minus twice the criterion because this is given by SAS and it's sometimes a bit easier to look at because it's not um, it's generally going to be a negative value. What we want is the uh, minimum value of this column, which will be the maximum value of the actual criterion. And you can see that model 6 gives the lowest value, so that would have been the model that had been chosen if you just based it on Ikeke's information criterion. It's not always the case, though, that um, significance testing ends up with the same model as Ikeke. It's not that you always have to go through this. Sometimes it's probably satisfactory just to fit patient effects as random, which will be this compound symmetry structure, but it's nice to know you can experiment with these different structures. And in some cases, they will have quite an effect on your results.